So welcome to our seminar this afternoon. Um, my name is Jenny Church. I chair the Royal Statistical Society's International Development Working Group, which I can still say is the newest um, working group um, of, of the society. There'll come a time when I can't say that anymore, but it's still okay at the moment. Um, Welcome to our seminar on the use of multidimensional indices of social progress, environmental and economic development. Um, before I go any further, I just want to explain that um, we are live streaming this meeting. This is a bit of a first, I believe, for the RSS. Um, so if I can ask, when we get to the discussion, um, if, if you can stand up and announce who you are and speak very clearly so that the microphone um, picks up. We don't have handheld microphones, we don't have that system in this room, um, but uh, we're hoping that it will work nevertheless because we're in a, a fairly small space. Um, we're live streaming, it's also being filmed to go out on YouTube. Um, this is one of the things that we're very keen to do um, in the International Development Working Group to ensure that our events are open um, to as wide an audience as possible. Um, obviously, we hope that um, there will be an audience for our events, not just in this country, but in um, overseas and in developing countries in particular. So, um, Coming to our event this afternoon, um, oh, <laughs> coming to our event this afternoon, I guess that if um, the science of statistics is about anything, it's about um, taking a large body of data and drawing inferences from it. And that really, I guess, is, at the, is, at, is the key um, to what we're doing um, with multidimensional indices of progress. Um, we're taking a large body of often quite disparate information and we're trying to answer a single question. We're trying to answer the question, in effect, are things getting better? Now, with the agreement to the Sustainable Development Goals uh, back in September, I think that gives um, added focus to, to these sorts of issues around indices. Um, with 169 targets and um, 250 plus indicators, I think it's clear that the demand for summary um, statistics 
summary measures is only going to increase. Um, now, of course, there are huge issues of data availability, of quality, um, of definition um, that underlie each and every one of those um, 250 indicators. We're not going to be able to address those all here this afternoon. I don't know how many of you will be aware, but the Royal Statistical Society and others um, issued a policy statement um, last month in connection with World Statistics Day calling for a data revolution um, to fill those gaps and improve quality of, of data for development. But I think um, today we have to address the issues around indices of progress on the basis almost of the status quo in terms of data quality um, and availability, even though we might be optimistic about the prospects for improvement. Um, we have to, we have to recognise where we are today and the fact that um, we, are, we are being called on um, for summary measures today using the materials we've got. So I'd like to thank Paul Allen very much indeed um, for organising this seminar um, and for his paper that um, was circulated in, in advance. I hope you've all had an opportunity to see that and read it, um, raising um, a wide variety of issues. I'm sure that will have stimulated um, questions and comments already in your minds, but I'm going to ask that you keep those until after the tea break. Um, the format for this event is going to be, Paul's going to first of all um, introduce the topic um, based on his, his paper. Um, then we're going to have some opening responses to the questions that have been raised in Paul's paper um, from Sabina Alkiri, Michael Green, and we hope Denise Livesley, though she is still on a train. I have to say that Paul was still on a train until very recently. There are problems on the line to Paddington today, um, but um, they, they, will, they, they will give some opening responses. Um, we'll then have a short tea break, and then it will be open to discussion from the floor. Um, Paul will then sum up, and um, I will make a few closing remarks. So without more ado, I'd like to... To, to pass over to Paul. Um, Paul is now at Imperial College London, but um, has spent many years in the government statistical service in all sorts of departments, um, but um, most recently at the Office for National Statistics, developing measures of well-being. So was very well placed to um, put this seminar together. So over to you, Paul. Thank you, thank you very much, and uh, it's great to see so many people, people here, and uh, hopefully people on on screen as well, live live stream as well, and um, maybe even hello to Andrea Rossi in Mozambique, who's one of the people to uh, stimulate this. So we might even have one person live streaming. Uh, Andrea is with UNICEF, I believe, and uh, hopefully is uh, is connected with us now. But hopefully can get it as well. So I just want to give a kind of overview to the paper, just kind of in a sense steering to the discussion. Uh, but without in any way attempting to kind of answer all the questions that, that, that were there in the paper. Um, I believe, sorry, I was so late, but I did arrive with three spare copies of the paper because nobody has, actually, people haven't managed to, to print it out, so they're, they're there if you, if you want it. You want it. Um, okay, well, as, uh, as Jenny said, you know, what's the question we're trying to, trying to answer? Well, there's a whole raft of questions, but here's one. You know, how are developing countries developing? What progress <coughs> are developing countries making? And as, as, as Jenny's kind of suggested, you know, there's lots of statistics that we want to use in monitoring, planning and evaluating international development, um, but it's actually more than uh, an increase in national income. And this is kind of one of the kind of key issues that I want to come to just very quickly. So if you look on the DFIDs website, for example, they're not just about supporting economic growth in developing countries, but also about education, health, women, girls, etc. So a, a lot of data called for, a lot of statistics called for. 
Um, so let's look on the World Bank. They've got a kind of great website full of, full of indicators. Um, uh, and if you ask the question, how Sub-Saharan Africa doing, developing countries thereof, um, is a screenshot of just um, a part of part of what you get. You get uh, at least four, but actually there are many more indicators below below there. So how is Sub-Saharan Africa doing, developing countries? Well, three of the four charts on that screen actually do show some kind of broad increase, uh, some kind of progress. Um, Side to side for World Bank, it's difficult to read what the time periods are here, whether it's all consistent, and there's lots of that to be done, but it's great to kind of see that. But actually, one of the three, sorry, one of the four indicators is there, it's with the other three, what's their measure of the environment, um, uh, shows a very different, different picture. So, in a sense, how can you kind of summarize that? What, what, what will be the answer to that, to, 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 to that question? Um, uh, and there's kind of another answer to it, which is actually all well, part of the historical way of answering this question is to focus at the one on the left, GDP or GNP or GNI, depending on which part of the world you're operating in. Um, that's a kind of headline measure of total economic activity. It is an index because it draws on a huge raft of data. Um, it's put together in a very consistent way according to standard uh, classifications, and standard definitions. The whole process of putting together the system of national accounts is, is managed by the United Nations. You, you couldn't get a more kind of robust and concrete um, set of statistics. Well, okay, apart from the data in some cases, but uh, in, as a kind of statistical uh, vision. Um, I won't go into the differences between GDP, GMP, and GNI, but just to make the point that there's one headline really that tends to, that, 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 that tends to, to, to dominate. Well, what's wrong with that? I mean, why shouldn't one tend to dominate? We live in a kind of world, um, you know, where economic progress is, is is one of the things that people are striving for. Well, actually, in itself, there are kind of a number of criticisms about about uh, GDP. Um, Graham Cole uh, calls it a made up entity uh, with assumptions about the nature of work. Um, it's an aggregate measure. What we get is GDP or GDP per head. We don't know anything about what's happening to inequalities, and if there are, there are any inequalities. Um, and this is kind of nice when GDP can actually go up when well-being goes down. So in the wake of national disasters, it's been quite an <coughs> GDP. And GDP ignores things that generally increase people's well-being wide, wide enough. And it doesn't help with the sustainability of current, current activities. But it's still invariably used as, uh, I think I can say it's still used as the measure of well-being and progress in, in many parts of the world. And if you read The Economist, it's the only thing that matters. If you read other journals, it's slightly more um, uh, there's much more about this quick advert in a book. It's very uh, modesty doesn't prevent me uh, showing the book that I wrote with, with David Hand. So if you want to kind of go into this much more, the well-being of nations, meaning motive and measurement, and all good booksellers now. But, but as Jenny said, actually there's lots of kind of statistics out there. Why are we limited to to, to GDP for a start? I mean, that's kind of the index question in a minute. But why not? And just look more broadly. Here's the United Nations Fundamental Principles for Official Statistics. Um, I've highlighted a bit in um, the first uh, the first principle, you know, serving the government, the economy, and the public with data about the economic, demographic, social, and environmental situation. I don't think you can get much that isn't covered by that. So there's a kind of challenge to national statistics offices um, to do uh, to, to do just that, to provide kind of the and to provide the data. Um, uh, and there are kind of lots of people who are kind of pushing for kind of broader pictures than just than just GDP. Here are some um, recently um, the Commission on the Measurement of Economic Performance and Social Progress, commonly known as the Stiglitz and Kibutzi uh, Commission, um, made 10, 10 recommendations about how to um, how to measure progress more broadly, but they didn't come out in favour of, of an index. Um, the OECD's Better Life in, Initiative. Many of you will have seen their, their, their website, um, and that, that allows you to produce an index using your own weights. And rather interestingly, the OECD, uh, with your permission, of course, I'm sure, capture those weights and therefore can form a kind of aggregate view of the weights that all of the people who go onto their website and who put, put weights in um, give to the, the different components that make up the, the overall. Um, elsewhere across Europe, um, the European Parliament's Beyond the UPP programme, the European Union, um, kind of gently kind of rumbling on, uh, particularly kind of driving uh, 
National Statistics Office was in, in, in Europe. But as Jenny mentioned, the uh, Sustainable Development Goals uh, enshrined in the, the recent uh, 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, um, as well as kind of uh, setting out particular uh, goals uh, and um, uh, indicating that, uh, um, implying that indicate, uh, and demonstrating that indicators are on, on, on the way to support those goals. Um, it's got you know, buried in paragraph 48 this uh, universal commitment to developing broader measures of progress to complement GDP. So there's clearly a kind of thrust here, a kind of progress here. There's a kind of uh, impetus here um, in terms of uh, taking, taking this work forward. Um, uh, and indeed, where, as we sit here today, it's kind of no, no shortage of interest. Which we've got uh, very delighted that uh, we have speakers here today who will kind of be able to tell us about that. Um, in the paper, um, I came up with, a, with David Hand, came up with a selection of just 20 multinational indices um, and, and sets and indicators that were available uh, last year in 2014. But actually, there's an earlier uh, working paper, UN uh, Development Program working paper, with 178 composite indices measuring performance, ranking or assessing countries in, 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 in some way or other. Um, now they're kind of they're, they're not all kind of continuous indices. Some of them were kind of one-off attempts to kind of measure these things. But somewhere between 20 and 178 is kind of the, uh, the present guess for how many in, in indices you, could, you, you, you can find out. Um, and the paper kind of touches on the kind of pros and cons of having of having an, an, an index for um, in the paper kind of sticking the same to the position that these are kind of disparate components. You wanted some way to have dashboard <laughs> measures. Um, the uh, uh, the New York Foundation recently um, published five headline, headline measures in addition to the GDP. So I guess that's, that's six rather than the five. But, um, uh, again, not in not producing one index, but with the idea of kind of getting on one on screen, if you like one uh, one headline news uh, item, um, an overall uh, an overall assessment. Um, and what the paper does is to try and kind of stem uh, uh, stimulate the discussion. Let's kind of really think about this in, in kind of six areas. So thinking about well, okay, let's sort of we can sort of see the case, but. Indicators to add both to what the indices to both kind of um, provide some sort of framework to the indicators, to kind of be a communications tool, um, uh, and, and they're there. We, we, we're not denying that they are published and they are used. Um, so, the kind of six areas for discussion, uh, the paper kind of goes through them in a lot more detail, but I try to summarize them like this that the, kind of, is there any value in kind of mapping the existing indicators, the UNDP? I mentioned did that in 2008. Uh, I did try to check, and I, as far as I can tell, there they, they, they don't have that. the resources or the ambition or the, perhaps they didn't see the need. I'm not sure to kind of update that, re re refresh that. Um, you know, but if, if, there, if there is a need, um, um, how can we kind of make sure that that kind of that, that's kind of uh, there to kind of meet user, 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 user needs. How can we kind of have some kind of inventory or portal that people could kind of go to that's relevant to, to development and it's going to help users kind of find a way around either the kind of indices that exist or the kind of being blind to indicators and, 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 and the kind of measures. But if we think that's a good idea, I mean how on earth would you, would you, would you do it and how would you maintain it? I mean, it's great having a kind of one-off publication as a UNDP um, uh, report, and I'm not kind of denying the value of that, it's a great, great starting point, but it, it's out of date as soon as it's printed, or it's on the website, it's out of date as soon as that goes through to there. So I think there'll be kind of major issues about, about that. But, but it, I, I guess you can think I'm looking at this in sentence, if you like, that also like with an economic eye. You know, so what's the supply, what's the, what's the use, uh, what's, the, what's the need, and, and how can we balance those? But also, kind of, if we're looking at the supply side, that there are indicators, there are indices out there already. Is there any need for some kind of critical review of those things? I'm sure we'll hear that when indices are put together, there is lots of effort goes into kind of producing a good and valid and, and perhaps even peer-reviewed index. Um, but how do kind of people approach that? 
from afresh? How do they kind of understand what went into it? Um, is there some is there, is there need for some kind of um, critical review, or or has it got, as I say in the paper, to be kind of user beware? Should we just is, is it more important to get indices out there uh, and kind of realise that actually the best we can do is kind of draw attention to it, make sure in fact more generally people um, are are statistically literate, but they're not kind of uh, they don't have detail on each uh, on each uh, aspect of it. Um, moving on, then, to kind of what's you know, are we clear about what people want? Which is what I'm now starting to call kind of global performance indicators. That's a phrase I picked up from 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 the paper. But is it is it clear what are the how these are to be used? What what are what are they used? Again, it'd be kind of great to hear the discussion how you are using them or how you intend uh, how you intend them to be used. Those of your your involvement. Um, in some senses, for the moment, the kind of user case is rather rather general. You know, that oh, we need them um, to kind of get a picture of how countries are performing. Um, for rather unspecified policy purposes. Here in the UK, a number of people have had a go at kind of trying to get some more coherent policy purposes out of well-being, well-being data. Uh, so Donald, uh, did that with a team of people um, after he left uh, left left the civil service. Um, but it's at the moment I think it's it's not quite clear what we're, what we're doing with these uh, what we're doing with these indicators. Or, may, or maybe it is. Maybe I just not I just said that. Great, great to hear what you say. Um, but then, do we perhaps need some kind of guidance in using in indicators? That sounds a bit um, uh, paternalistic, perhaps. I'm not sure. Um, but there are things like you know there might be a kind of checklist of things that we might want to be aware of, missing data. Like the accuracy of the data that we're dealing with, assumptions that have been made, how people fill the gaps. Um, what about extrapolating from past points in time? Because not all data is available uh, uh, in the uh, present time. So, you know, there's, there's perhaps some kind of guidance issues there which we might want to discuss. Um, I call that uh, I call that then kind of rather grandly kind of user capability gap. So, I mean, actually, having said we don't know how. These indices are to be used. Do we have the tools to find out how these indices are, are, are to be used? Do we kind of have enough mechanisms in place to understand um, the specification of different user requirements? Um, do we have kind of uh, enough physical support users to kind of uh, understand the, the uh, input materials and interpret the results and apply apply these indices? Um, and uh, and last and by no means least, but but far from least, um, again, Jenny touched on this in her, in her, in her introduction. Um, what are the implications of all this for, kind of the, in particular, the national statistical producers? By that I mean the people in country <coughs> producing data that are used for indices um, internationally or even within, within the country. I'm not making the assumption that these are all national statistics offices, but in some cases they will be. They might be. Um, National institutions, uh, government departments, whatever they might be, private um, or research organisations. Um, but at the bottom of um, the kind of heap here, there is a kind of lot of people producing data, which goes to produce the raft of information that's addressed by the United Nations fundamental principles, which gets drawn on um, and, and defined and added together in some way to, to perform an index. Uh, to produce an, an overall index. Um, and I kind of see this as, uh, in a sense, the scope for, for synergy here, because um, the sustainable development goals are clearly raising the profile of, of, of data. Um, we hear a lot about a data revolution and all of that. Um, it, seems it, would seem, it seems to me to be a shame if these things are done for kind of series of wild purposes. You know, we must improve data sources so that we can measure the sustainable development goals better. Yeah, that's great, but can we also use that same, those same improvements for other purposes, including uh, improving indices uh, of, of progress? So that's really all I kind of wanted to, to say by way of introduction. I hope it kind of takes you through the paper, gives you some things to, to think about. But really, the important thing is the discussion from here on. And my thanks again to the three sitting and discussing. Thank you very much indeed, Paul. Um, Right, well, um, we have, as I mentioned before, three, um, three speakers who um, are going to provide first reactions. So first of all, can I um, invite Sabina Alkira to, to
to join us. I should have explained that um, we are limited um, in terms of um, speaker space to these three seats um, for the purposes of the live streaming. So um, that's why we're sitting rather cosily <laughs> at the front here. Um, so Sabina um, is uh, the Oxford Poverty and Human Development Initiative. Um, and over to you, Sabina. Thank you so much. Um, thank you very much to both of you for this invitation. And I, I, like the others have said, I really look forward to the discussion that we're going to have, uh, most of all. And I thought that what I would do in responding and commenting on Paul's paper is first to present in six or seven minutes an index that we work on, one of the different indices that illustrates the methodology of multidimensional poverty measurement, and then have the rest of the time, in a sense, to reflect on some of the qualities of that measure in relation to Paul's question in his paper. And the bottom line is that I very much salute the need for critical review. I think that indices, some of which are composite, some of which are multidimensional, or there are different terms, and these terms are used in different ways, but the quality of them varies greatly. And the users don't necessarily have the kind of health warnings that they need to interpret them correctly. And so I think that that would be a, a great service. Um, so first of all, just briefly for those of you who are, are not aware, um, we work on a lot of national statistics, um, and we also work on one global measure or international measure, um, which has been published since 2010 by UNDP. Um, and this is an index which is structured around three dimensions, which are equally weighted and 10 indicators. Um, so a person is deprived if a, somebody in their family is malnourished in their household, the jury household. If a child has died, no one has five years of schooling, a child not attending school up to the age at which they would complete class eight, or their household is deprived in each one of these six indicators. So as you can see, we're looking at a matrix. The rows of the matrix um, are the people, and each person either has a deprivation or not. So we're taking ordered categorical data, ordinal data, dichotomizing it so that the final measure is robust to monotonic transformations of the underlying data. And what that means very simply is that the measure only relies on the definitions that are transparently there and not on value judgments about how you treat these, these variables. And so um, when we come to testing robustness, we will look at the robustness of the measure to these um, uh, indicators, uh, uh, cutoffs. And so in a sense, what we are looking at is deprivations within each household and then identifying each member of a household as poor or non-poor in a way I'll describe according to the household deprivation profile. And that's for reasons of the data that we use. Um, and we also equally weight the three dimensions and we have robustness tests for those weights and for other weights. Um, but we justify that following Tony Atkinson as well as the legacy of the Human Development Index and its various measures to try to make a measure that's legible to policy because the ultimate aim of this is in some way to have a, a space in the policy discourse. So um, for each person, I have a picture there showing you presentations that are made not to statisticians, but outside of it, we will have their vector, their poverty profile, their vector of zero one deprivation cutoffs that are weighted. And on the basis of their weighted score, we identify each person as poor or not. We have a second cutoff, a poverty cutoff, and in this case, it's 33%. So if a person experiences deprivations in at least one third of the weighted indicators, Kuban Bhutan is deprived in many more than that, then that person and each member of their household are identified as poor. And if they have a lesser uh, extent of deprivations, they're identified as non-poor. Obviously, you run every single poverty measure, um, but you report one and then do the robustness test. So the structure of the measure uh, is, is in, in that way, with each person and then a poverty cutoff. And the final measure then is a, uh, an elaboration of the income poverty gap measure to multidimensional space. So it's the percentage of people who are poor because they're deprived in one third or more of the weighted indicators. And you multiply this by a score called intensity which is the average proportion of deprivations poor people experience. So Puba had 67% of people in Bhutan, much less. 
um, but it's it's the average percentage. Do, is the average poor person in the country deprived in one half, 60% of 70% of the relevant deprivations? It gives a sense of the intensity, the severity, the gap of, of poverty. So why this measure perhaps is useful beyond the fact that it can be rigorously applied with ordinal data is that although you have a headline, which is one number, and you can say with significance whether it's gone up or down, you can then break it apart in different ways. So I'm going to whiz through some slides very quickly just to show the dashboard of consistent sub or partial indices that the measure gives rise to. So first of all, um, and I'm using the 2015 update, which has 101 countries covering 5.2 billion people. Um, very good country coverage, 96% in Sub-Saharan Africa, 94% in South Asia, 92% in East Asia. So the headline of a dashboard is that across 101 countries, 30% of people are poor, or 1.6 billion people. And then, of course, you can see the percentage of people who are poor um, for each country. And you can compare that percentage, something the media are already familiar with, with, for example, the percentage of people who are poor by the dollar twenty-five or dollar ninety a day income poverty measures. So in this graphic, we depict all of the countries with the poorest countries in terms of the headcount ratio on this side. The bar is the percentage of people poor multidimensionally, and the dot is for surveys fielded within three years of the ones we draw upon the percentage of people who are income poor. So you can see the relationship and with other indices as well, and the mismatch is quite large. So we argue that you need both. You need an income poverty measure, but you also need a measure to complement it and to bring into view these other aspects of poverty. Um, and although we are simply looking at the headcount ratio there, and they could match, um, just to give you a bit of a, a health warning here, even if you have the same headcount ratio, they may not. Here's an example from China, where you have income poverty and multidimensional poverty of different levels, so you would presume that all the people who are income poor are multidimensionally poor, but the overlap is much lower. And in all the data sets where we have the full complement of indicators, we have this mismatch as you do in Europe. But that being said, you can look at the headcount ratios. A couple other things. One is you can add in intensity. So this is the same countries in the same order, but now the height of the bubble is the average intensity of the poor people. So you see transparently that by adding intensity, you can see that in the poorest countries, not only is the greatest number of people poor, but each poor person is on average deprived in a greater um, percentage of the deprivation. So it, it's adding information, but really it also gives it quite good axiomatic property of being able to break it down. So just running through the breakdowns, you have a national, and then you can go to subnational. Um, and so that's quite useful for mapping poverty within countries. Um, you don't have rural urban price adjustments, which um, make this difficult. So in terms of income poverty measures, you can't do this with the dollar twenty-five a day. Um, and then you can also make comparisons across regions in different ways, including this basic one, just in the extent of poverty. But then you can break it down to see of the poor people, what are the deprivations they simultaneously experience. Um, so this is Nigeria. And what is the percentage of population who are poor and are deprived in each indicator? And you can do that nationally or subnationally. And so when we come to national measures, this is in a sense the policy value of them. This is the, all of the subnational detail um, helps with subnational policy. Um, so that's the MPI in a nutshell, none of the findings, but just the structure of the measure. And so now I'd like to um, just reflect a little bit on that in terms of the current index uh, interest in composite measures. And first of all, we have to address the Sen Stiglitz Fitzcusi Commission and say, what does this add to a dashboard, a current question the Atkinson Commission and the World Bank is facing? So let's take those 5.2 billion people and let's take these 10 indicators. And this is the percentage of people who are poor or deprived in each of them across the 5.2 billion people. So you, this is a dashboard in a sense of the globe for these indicators. <coughs> and my question to you is how many of these people are deprived in at least one indicator at the same time? Is it just 53%? Is it something higher? Or two indicators? Or three? So dashboard cannot show anything about the joint distribution. So in fact, um, 
3.9 billion people, 75% of these 5.2 billion are deprived in at least one indicator. And then to go beyond that, we bring in some weights that I introduced earlier, and we get to the 1.6 billion that are deprived in 33% of the waste indicators. So one thing that a multidimensional measure does is it actually adds information. And the information it adds is the joint distribution of deprivations. And particularly in terms of leaving no one behind, what, who are the people who are deprived in everything at the same time? And also because policy needs to be multi-sectoral and integrated, what are the different compositions of simultaneous deprivations that different populations are experiencing that will affect allocation, but it also affects the behaviors of poor people. A second, and this is a terminological, I don't feel strongly about it, but my co-author James Foster does feel strongly that the MPI that we work on is not a composite index. So the, the, the idea is clear, the, the wording you can go with or you'd like to. But most indices, IHDI, Social Progress Index, Global Peace Index, and the Bathroom Prosperity, you first get an aggregate indicator across society for each of these. And then you aggregate across all of them, the percentage of kids who are malnourished, the GDP per capita, some, some indicator. Um, and in contrast, building on the unmet basic needs tradition in Latin America and the counting tradition in Europe, the multidimensional poverty index goes first horizontally, which means you need all of the variables present for the same unit of analysis, like an individual or a household. So there are data requirements because of that, but there's also a different, a very different structure um, that gives rise to some different properties. And so I would at least beg that in this discussion and categorization of composite indices, these kinds of structural issues, the order of aggregation, be considered. Another, you didn't mention Paul here, but in your paper you mentioned the problem of sub-Saharan African data. So I just thought I would give a little bit of a plug that we cover 39 countries and 391 sub-national regions in sub-Saharan Africa. And um, in 34 of them, we have data that are 2010 or more recent. So the data is quite good. Uh, we cover, as I said, 96% of the population. The only countries we can't disaggregate are South Africa and Guinea-Bissau. Um, so actually, Sub-Saharan Africa, in terms of the MPI, is strong, but it's strong because of international data, donor-funded, and the global and re data revolution is not focusing necessarily on these sorts of data. And just a couple more points. This is a little bit more technical, but I think it's, it's terribly important, is the issue of weights. Because this is, as your paper said, across all discussions of multidimensional indices, there are questions about the weights. And Paul's paper said, it's, it, what, what space are we measuring in? If we're measuring in the space of money, then price uh, money metric weights makes sense. If you're measuring the safe, the space of capabilities or functionings or some other uh, human rights in the case of Mexico, then the weights are normative choices, perhaps, or others use statistical weights. But that's not the point I would like to discuss. I'd like to draw your attention to something I don't hear discussed, which is the difference between the, what I will call precision weights used in, for example, the Human Development Index and the kind of weights used in a multidimensional poverty index. So in a Human Development Index or many of these similarly structured indices, you have three or more dimensions and a cardinal value for each of them. And then you apply a weighting structure that has to guard the trade-offs within each dimension at different points of achievement. And also between each dimension in each level of achievement. So a linear set of weights or equal weights in the case of HDI, as Martin Revalian has rightly pointed out, have very different um, significance at different points of the distribution on two indicators. Um, and in a sense, these weights work if you have ratio scale data. And I don't know how often we can say with a straight face we have ratio scale data. Um, but uh, I think they are much more difficult and the robustness for them is very much more di different than ours. So in the case of an MPI and these similar structured counting measures, um, you're looking at a zero one vector of deprivations. We can talk later if you'd like about how to go into depth by setting different vectors of cutoffs. Um, and then the weights, and James Foster prefers to call them deprivation values, are simply set on the presence or absence of a clearly defined deprivation. Um, it's on or it's off. Um, so there is no marginal rate substitution between the elements. Um, and so they don't have to calibrate 
you know, the achievement of somebody with a life expectancy of 80, but an income of, you know, uh, much less. So I think that, again, clarity in composite industries about what the weights are could clarify the discussions quite a bit. And finally, I'd like to have three slides, um, and I will do them very quickly because of time. Um, one on the constraints of uh, the indices we use, one on the methodology, and one on the transparency. So first, in terms of the data constraints, we require all of the variables from the same survey, which very much limits. We couldn't put employment in it. The data didn't exist in the surveys we used. We couldn't put income, violence, others. Um, also, because we require the same indicators for each person, in our case, being academics, we're over the top rigorous, and we drop anybody who doesn't have variables in every single of the 10 indicators. We report the missing values. They're very, very small in most cases. We do any bias tests if they are not. Um, the updates and the exclusion by survey data of other populations is well known, but it doesn't mean it doesn't need to be fixed. And I would very much plug for a need of oversampling of some missed out populations in the case of poverty. Um, but I also wanted to acknowledge, because it's nothing to do with me, uh, that the quality of data we've used on the MPI have increased greatly. Um, for example, we have all 10 indicators in all of the African countries we use. Um, and the number of countries with comparable uh, definitions has gone up. Very briefly, in terms of oops, transparency, um, what we do to try to um, be transparent is we put up a methodological note that has the precise treatment, there's a sample do file, um, and then there's a list of any specific country country-specific treatments we've done of the data. And the data tables have, and I think this is something Paul, I would very much call for, a percentage of retained sample, any missing indicators, uh, the data year and source, how to find it. We also have confidence intervals. Um, and for making comparisons over time, we don't leave it to people. We strictly harmonize the microdata ourselves and post strictly harmonized data sets online. Because that's, as you may know, huge amount of work, <laughs> but that way uh, people make comparisons that are justified and are not encouraged to make comparisons they cannot make. And the final slide is on methodology. Um, that in the case of the global MPI, we do implement robustness tests. For example, using standard errors, you know, a little one for an international measure is the percentage of pairwise comparisons that are, in our case, strict, not even weak, weakly uh, distinct, uh, or the same across different variations of the parameters. So for a poverty cutoff between 20% and 40%, and 40%, 91% of our country rankings are the same. Or for weights between 25 and 50%, 85% of our rankings are the same. So I think this is very important to make very transparent to any skeptics what implications their ideas would have on the measure. Um, we also look at the redundancy of indicators associations and standard errors, which is very important and even not done on the dollar 25 a day because of, of its particular structures. And so any significance that you see in a policy document like that, if we say it's bigger, it's actually significantly bigger by at least 5%. So these are the kinds of methodologies that perhaps that distinguish some indices from others. So that's the end. Um, I've gone over one minute. I'm sorry, you're fine. Um, we do have a book, um, I'm sorry. We do have a book on it. And for the students here, everything is full text online and downloadable, so you don't have to buy it. Um, so that's what I wanted to share. Thank you so much. Thank you very much indeed, Sophia. Thank you. So I'd now like to invite uh, Michael Green, who's the um, Executive Director of Social Progress Initiative, um, to give his reactions and, and thoughts on Paul's paper and the issues raised. So, over to you, Thank you, Jenny. And delighted to be here. It's always a pleasure to be the least eminent person in the room. Um, <laughs> I should say, the invitation to this event went to our research director, Amy Wares, um, who is the person who knows all about these issues. But Amy, unfortunately, is based in the United States, and with Thanksgiving, couldn't be here. So, I, as a London based person who doesn't know what he's talking about, got invited to this event. Why did I say yes? Why was I so foolish? Because I must say that all my interaction with the statistical community since we launched Social Progress Index has always been fantastic. The wisdom and generosity of the group, um, Denise and, uh, and Sabine in particular, but many other people have been very helpful and generous to us in giving their wisdom. So 
uh, I come along here uh, knowing that this is a, a supportive community uh, that hopefully won't hold my ignorance against me. Um, maybe I'll offer a, a slightly different way of coming at this, since I'm not uh, a statistical scientist, of why on earth we created the Social Progress Index, uh, a new addition to the community of indices since 2012. Um, uh, have we added to the problem? Why have we added to the problem? Um, what on earth do we think we're doing? Um, uh, you said maybe that might be the way to come at it. And especially, I suppose, because we really started from the position of users. The Social Progress Index was born in a World Economic Forum Global Agenda Council meeting in 2009. So as you may know, the World Economic Forum every so often gets together a bunch of eminent people and gives them a problem to think about and to come up with an idea. So it's actually my old friend and co-author, Matthew Bishop from The Economist, was chairing a Global Agenda Council on philanthropy and social investment back in 2009. So it was a community of a bunch of people from business working on social issues, people from the impact investing community, philanthropy, social enterprise. Not so much from actually the official governmental aid world, which is kind of interesting. And that group came back saying, we feel that we lack a common language of measurement to help us think about where our priorities are in terms of addressing global social issues. So the, it was very much this, what Matthew then proposed as was then called the Social Competitiveness Index, emerged from that discussion as a demand from a set of users. Um, the second thing that I think drove the, uh, the initiative was the fact that we were sitting in a World, in a world Economic Forum meeting. The WEF has produced the Global Competitiveness Index uh, that I think a bunch of people in the room felt had had a genuine impact on policy and that producing rankings like this can drive change. And that therefore the idea of creating a composite index on the social side would actually be something that would be of practical policy use in driving change in the world. So that was sort of where the idea first started. Um, and then I must say, we, it took us uh, then uh, more than three years to actually launch the Social Progress Index after that initial discussion. And that was because we did spend a long time asking whether or not this was something that was actually going to add value. This was not something we went into lightly. Um, you know, we knew that there were, the world does have too many indices, um, a lot of them are rubbish, um, a lot of them are produced for PR reasons. You know, did, we didn't want to add to the problem, we did want to at least believe ourselves, uh, you can tell me whether we were right or not, that we were adding some value. Um, and in the end we decided we'd give it a try, and that we had something we thought was worth testing, which was the first social progress index that we launched as a beta version in April 2013. Um, and very briefly, just the reason we thought was there was some, uh, it was different from what was available already, was that the Social Progress Index has no economic variables, uh, measures only outcomes, and also very much tries to look at countries at all levels of development, looking from poorest to richest, so we're trying to measure countries at all levels of development. And so we launched that beta index in April 2013, um, got some great feedback, and have been produced two further versions 2014 and 2015, uh, and are going to carry on producing that. Uh, on an annual basis. Maybe the thing to look at next is you know, what the impact means in terms of we're thinking about users. And I think users I see in, in two ways. One has been around sort of practical use for policy makers, you know, whether that's decision makers in government or business or in civil society. And I think one thing we've found, and I don't think we even thought about this when we started, was that actually creating a measure that has no GDP or other economic measure in it actually makes the Social Progress Index very easy to adopt. Because it's not saying, here's something that's there to replace GDP. It's saying, here's something you can put alongside GDP as a complement. And that seems to have been very attractive to the system makers in various sectors. But it actually, you know, if you've got a composite measure that includes economic measures, what's its relationship to GDP? Is it superior to GDP? Or what is it? Whereas if we say this is something that's entirely complementary, you can carry on doing your economic measurement, but put this alongside and see what this does. Seems to be attractive. So we found that's from national governments like Paraguay, through some state governments in Brazil, <coughs> through city governments in Latin America, where we focused in the last few years. We've seen that that, that offer has been attractive. Um, and then what we've been doing since then is diversifying from Latin America. And we actually focused on um, uh, which countries next. We actually decided in terms of positioning that it was actually a good idea to try and go to some of the richer markets next. So I think early next year we're going to be launching, uh, well actually no, the European Commission is going to be launching a social progress index 
for the regions of Europe. Um, so this is the, the regional directorate of the European Commission is producing this to inform EU regional policy. And then also we're working with a range of states and cities uh, in the United States and hopefully moving into Canada as well. And one of the things we've done uh, in terms of developing these sub-national indices is we've said that the basic social progress index framework has three dimensions, 12 components, and 52 indicators. It's the thing that we've kept rigid is the basic structure of the model, the three dimensions and the 12 components. But we've been very flexible about the use of the indicators. We've said, you know, since the, the index is about measuring these, the 12 components, the 12 concepts that underlie the social progress index model, find the data that's available in your geography that coherently measures those 12 concepts. So that means there's a lot of flexibility in the way that the social progress index can be used. So for example, in uh, we did a social progress index for the Amazon region of Brazil um, for 770 municipalities. And there, one of the issues under shelter that came up was a uh, waste collection. And that came back from communities being a very important indicator of quality of shelter. And so we've substituted that indicator into the model. In Europe, a lot of concern about uh, young people not in education or employment or training and needs. And so that indicator has been incorporated into the model. So there's a flexibility in the social progress index model that can be customized to different con contexts and also can respond to data availability. One of our big problems globally is lack of data on educational attainment, um, where it actually turns out that the Brazilian Amazon, we could find that data. So where there was better data available, we could incorporate it into the model. Now, what this obviously means is that you don't have formal comparability between the results from the Brazilian Amazon municipality and the global index. But in a sense, we're relaxed about that. So as long as the tool is useful and practical and applied as measuring the same underlying concepts, uh, then it's then that's the way to go. So that's in a sense the way we're kind of rolling it out by making it flexible and usable in that way. And then hopefully we'll see it starting to have a practical impact. We're certainly seeing you know, where governments are using it, that it's starting to influence budgetary allocations and policies. And you know, we'll, we'll test and see how that works as we move forward. So that's one piece, it's been very much been guided by this sort of usefulness piece, talking to our users, you know, saying to people, how do, how do you find this most useful, and therefore being flexible in the way it's deployed. I think the other piece is going back to the, um, uh, to the whole issue of the influence of the Global Competitiveness Index. It's this idea that as well as you know, the, the formal task of creating statistics and measurement, let's also remember that these are political tools. Uh, I think it's back to the point, you know, Douglas Adams, meaning of life, universe, and everything is 42, you know, is actually the most profound joke about economic, and, in economic policy. If you cannot produce a measure that comes up with an answer like 42, it won't get traction with politicians and the media. So you've got to have a way you can somehow simplify measures down so they can really have that kind of critical traction. And that's been one of the, sort of the inspirations uh, behind Social Progress Index being able to be you know, produce, reduce down to a simple score so we can produce rankings. Because that's the stuff that does sort of work politically. And what that's going to us thinking about is moving forward is the whole uh, issue about where we're going with sustainable development goals. As we know, 17 goals, 169 targets, hundreds of indicators. How on earth is that going to actually get traction? In a past life, um, I worked for DFID in the British government and uh, was head of communications during the 2005 Make Poverty History campaign. And there's one myth I always feel it's important to, to bust, which is the myth that the Millennium Development Goals were a great communications product. I mean, they really suck. I mean, I can barely say Millennium Development Goals. Yeah? Um, <laughs> what worked with the Millennium Development Goals was actually the Make Poverty History campaign. Uh, since there was an underlying concept that defined what the Millennium Development Goals were about, that was communicated in 2005 as part of that campaign. It wasn't the goals themselves. Um, I think in 2005, there was a push by the UN to raise awareness of the MDGs. Um, and one of the countries of focus was Italy. And at the end of 2005, polling was done across Europe. And it was true. Italy did show the highest level of awareness of the MDGs. Italy also showed the lowest level of support for increasing aid. <laughs> I think the UK showed the lowest level of awareness of the MDGs in Europe and the highest level of public support for increasing aid. <laughs> um, so I think making people aware of the MDGs or aware of the SDGs 
training children to school to recite all 17 SDGs <laughs> is, yeah, is not going to be the way forward. You've got to make these politically useful. And I think this is a concern about the, the, these SDGs are incredibly unwieldy. Sustainable Development Goals is slightly easier to say than Millennium Development Goals. But uh, what's the underlying concept? How do we pull this all together? <coughs> and so one thing we, we try to do with the Social Progress Index is, you know, we looked at the, the SDGs and we did actually there's a pretty reasonable match between the concept of the SDGs and the concept of the Social Progress Index. So well, it's, you know, why don't we apply this as a way of, you know, as a popular way of tracking uh, the SDGs? And so we got together with people who are sort of smart campaigners, and they said, well, don't call it the Social Progress Index, uh, and don't give it names like Foundations of Wellbeing. So we turned into something we call the People's Report Card. Um, we took the idea that, in a sense, these goals are about a commitment that the leaders of the world have made to the people of the world, that these goals are only going to be achieved or stand a chance of being achieved if people hold their leaders accountable to do it, and that this is their, these goals should be a tool for people to hold their governments to account. And how do we hold people to account? We have report cards. And so we've distilled it down, so we're now giving the world a score on uh, A to F scale on how it's doing, uh, and then we're going to update that on a year-by-year -year basis. This year we just did one for the world as a whole. The world as a whole scores a C-, um, <laughs> it's where an A is achieving the SDGs. Um, and then next year we're going to start producing country report cards and see how we're going to try and engage and mobilise some interest around that. Um, and it's like that's, that's, these things are only going to be effective if we can mobilise interest. And I really want to sort of speak for that constituency of this debate, is that we, these things have got to inspire. The, the, the mirror, the wonderful thing behind GDP, why it's conquered the world, is not because it's simple. I mean, as Paul said in the introduction, it's very clear the GDP is not simple. Ask people to explain how GDP is created. You know, it's not simple. Yeah, but it's because it's got a simple number, a simple number, because it's become part of the public debate. We now, when someone talks about economic growth as three percent, this absolutely thing that people don't really understand what it means is talked about in a meaningful way in our political discourse, and that's where we have to get to if we're going to incorporate other aspects of well-being into our debate and shift that debate. Um, let me say a couple of things on the very practical thing. Um, I think, you know, in terms of indices, composite indices coming together, um, certainly we very strongly support transparency. I mean, I think that those, anyone who's not publishing their methodology, their data, has got a big problem. Everyone should be doing that. Um, secondly, we're very strongly supportive of collaboration. Um, and I think one of the collaborations we're looking at now is the new International Panel on Social Progress. I think that's a great opportunity to bring together scholars in this field who work towards trying to bring some common understandings. Um, and then on the very practical question of just keeping track of all the um, of all the indices that are out there. I mean, we actually keep our own mapping of all the indices that we see. And I'm sure many other organisations out there keep their own mapping. <laughs> Why don't we publish it? Well, because basically no one would read it. Because there should be lots and lots of different mappings. Which I think is at one point, which is that actually the Wikipedia pages about this are really sad. Yeah? I mean, if you want to know about who's in one direction and what they have for breakfast, you know, that's on Wikipedia. If you want to know how we're measuring the performance of our societies, the Wikipedia pages are a bit ropey. So maybe eh, we in this room uh, and online should be putting a bit of effort in to try and make sure that we actually have that resource, the global resource, actually is accurate and up to date. So that's a complete that's proposal. Right. How's that? Thank you very much indeed, Mike. <laughs> I have to say that against question two, I put um, in, in, in Paul's paper, I had actually written Wikipedia approach. So maybe maybe that's the way forward. There Thank you go. very much indeed, Michael. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm now going to invite Denise Lucy, who's just joined us hot <laughs> from a delayed train. So thank you very much indeed, Denise. Um, right, if we can... Yeah, I do apologise. I don't like coming into meetings like that. It's very rude. I do apologise. I was going to be here ages early, um, but some poor soul jumped in front of the train. Um, so I think we all have to think that absolutely in yeah. all her and families. And train drivers. Thank you. 
I just get from for Denise while while she's setting up. But we are like we are being live streamed. Denise. Oh, this is right. the first for the RSS. Okay, and this is why we're sitting rather cozy <laughs> right, right here, okay. um, <laughs> so that so that we're in in in, in screen in, in screen view. Um, anyway, so um, okay. Well, thank you very much, and again, my apologies for being late. Um, I knew uh, broadly, I think, what what was going to be said by the other speakers, so I hope mine will be complimentary to that. Um, and uh, I really enjoyed Michael's presentation. I think I agree with a lot that he said, but I'm going to be putting somewhat of a negative spin on some of these issues. Um, and I wanted to pick up three aspects of, of Paul's excellent paper uh, around goals, performance indicators, and a few words on composite ind indices. At the end, I've also got all 17 goals. I didn't know whether anybody brought the goals. Or... So I'm not going to show you each of those 17 in turn, but I have got them if anybody wanted to ask questions about the 17 SDGs. So goals. Goals are set at world summits, at world fora, as we've heard. They're also committed to in international legislation. And they also form part of aid agreements. So many of our countries go and agree with, um, with recipient countries that they're going to measure performance in respect of, of indicators. And they try and use, um, wherever possible, of global, globally accepted indicators for that process. And I think one of the big questions that we have to ask is that the goals are often not part of a political, of a statistical process. They're set as part of a political process. And as statisticians, we often have difficulty in translating those goals into uh, targets and indicators. So there are lots of questions. Many of these were raised in Paul's paper around issues to do with the measurability of goals. And we shouldn't forget that goals are mainly about change over time. So it's not point in time estimates. And the very thorny issue about whether the things that we're measuring actually change enough over time for the very crude measures we use of aggregate statistics and so on being able to pick up that change, I think is a critical issue that we have to address. Um, I've used this slide many times in the Royal Statistical Society. It comes up again and again, but it's just to give you a sense of the fact that quality of data has many, many different dimensions. And when you're talking to relatively naive users of statistics, they don't appreciate that there are many aspects of the quality of data that we have to take into account when we're looking at the quality of these indicators. Um, one of the things that we've seen in the context of the global goals is the rise of performance monitoring. Um, and the indicators are being used to hold governments to account for their stewardship of the public services. And so um, from a political perspective, it's important for us to appreciate that government, governments are both monitoring the public services and being monitored by the performance indicators. Because even though the, the global indices of various sorts are sometimes <coughs> produced by independent organisations, so they're very dependent upon the official statistics from within the country. And so we have this tension. Um, and because of that, that sort of dual role, it's really critical that we pay attention to performance monitoring being done with integrity. Um, and that we're aware of, cognizant of, the incentives to distort the, the results. And those incentives, incidentally, in relation to development and development aid can go in both directions. So I've been in a meeting in Nigeria, where in the morning, we were with one set of aid agencies and the Nigerian government was arguing that they had made this significant progress over the last few years. And the performance of their education system was outstanding because the aid agency 
was very concerned with if we put funding in here, is it actually going to be used effectively? And then in the, in the afternoon, it was a different age paradigm, a different set of agencies, and they were arguing that, that Nigeria's education system was desperately poor and really needed resources and had been falling behind because the international organisations hadn't put enough resources in. And it was the same people in the room. Mm -hmm. um, and so the manipulation of data um, and the extent to which uh, they decide to use, to look for uncomfortable truths, I think is really critical. Um, one of, of my bugbears is that we need to resist the pigeonholing of statistics. I'm, I'm actually in favor of performance indicators. And I think despite what Michael says about it not being a great communication tool, it actually, the MDGs have led to a lot of improvements and a lot of improvements in the quality of statistics in many countries because they garnered attention to some key statistics. So I'm not, despite this, this set of slides, I'm not actually negative about things like the performance indicator frameworks of the UN, so the MDGs and now the SDGs. Um, but I do have concerns and I wanted to just highlight some risks. One of the problems is that they do tend to be used as sticks rather than carrots. I work in a world where I believe in trust and building trust and encouraging people. And it really bothers me that we use statistics so often in order to, to argue what hasn't been done or hasn't been done well. We all know about them being unintended consequences, and we can all cite examples of that, I think, from our own environments where there's a, an emphasis on performance indicators. And I've mentioned incentives and so on. One of the problems is they can promote a rather narrow use of data. And we have had problems in some of the international statistics uh, discussions about the country saying, they don't collect data because it isn't part of the MDGs. So we saw a lower emphasis on data relating to employment because it wasn't in the MDGs. It's now in the SDGs. It's partly why there was such a fight to get things into the SDGs. And then you've got problems of league tables. It's related to the issue of, of the sticks. And, and sometimes it can, take, it can mean that we take our eye off the big issues. Um, Paul, uh, mentions the wonderful RSS report that even though it was written some years ago, I still refer to a lot, um, the good, the bad and the ugly. Um, but I would also encourage you to read something like Francis report on mid stats, which to me was all about management over focusing on performance indicators and taking their eye off the important issues of the delivery of quality of care. Um, so we often hit the target but miss the point. Um, the MDGs and the SDGs and other indicators rely on cross-nationally comparable data. I'm actually an advocate for cross-nationally comparable data because I believe that knowledge of the self is gained through knowledge of others. But there is a tension between the value and importance of cross-national and its fragility and the problem of the extent to which the, uh, the, the differences are artifacts of the measurement processes. Um, uh, somebody called Jenny Church many years ago wrote, uh, comparability is only skin deep. I don't know if you remember that. Yes. <laughs> um, there are enormous challenges to comparability, and I don't have time in just a few minutes to go through all of, of these, but lots of challenges in terms of language, culture, and um, resources, context, etc. So those of us who work in comp um, um, data, gathering data or analyzing data that where we want comparability across areas, across times, or face these sorts of difficulties. We don't, as statisticians, look enough about some of the difficulties to do with language. Um, and uh, I do recommend reading Umberto Eco on the topic of language, it's absolutely fantastic. Um, but one of the difficulties we have is that 
um, a concept actually has to make sense within a culture, within a society, for you to be able to translate it into a language of that, you know, of that country. And so there are lots of difficulties, and the more we go to some of the softer targets, some of the, the SDG, SDG targets, I think we're going to have difficulties about whether justice, for example, means the same thing in different societies. So there's just the extent to which we're agreed around the goals, never mind translating them into targets and indicators. Um, the indicator model, of course, assumes you get comparable data across the world, but it does make assumptions about the universality of aim. Um, and one of the difficulties we have is the statistical PAMA has been owned by richer countries in the, in the main. So we can see sort of imperialistic systems. It's getting better. The SDG is much better than the MDGs in this respect. There's much greater ownership, much greater participation. And um, Paul raises this in his paper. Um, but we've still got statistical systems under-resourced, especially at country level. And you know, if you've got a tiny little statistical office, you don't have the resources to go and engage in numerous international and regional meetings about goals and targets and indicators. You don't get your voice heard in those. Um, so countries with resources play a bigger role. And there is still a concentration on, on facts and assuming that comparison is unproblematic. Un un Lots of problems with the model, as I've indicated. Um, the assumption that one size fits all. Um, I'm really pleased to hear that you're flexible in the social progress index. I think that's really important. Um, the difficulty that we have, that the problems facing cutting edge and, and, and training tail countries, those sorts of needs are very different. Um, context being really important. Uh, variation within countries and the extent to which that's given enough attention. I'll come back to that in a minute. In the SDGs, it's given more attention. At last, we have some indicators to do with inequality. Um, but one of the problems of the whole of the UN system is that the nation is the unit of analysis. And so I always used to laugh in UN meetings that officially Vanuatu has the same vote as China. In practice, of course, it isn't like that at all because China is listened to in all the informal outside of meetings where there are people voting and so on, they influence to an incredible degree. But there is a problem, and um, I used to say to my colleagues, if we actually want to achieve the MDGs, we put all our resources into Vanuatu and the Solomon Islands and so on, the smaller countries, because then you get more countries achieving the MDGs. You wouldn't put your resources into, into Brazil and China and so on because the MDGs were written in terms of percentage of countries achieving. Um, ownership is important, but it is difficult when countries aren't involved in the choice and the design of indicators. It is difficult because putting things in a comparability framework means that results often look unfamiliar to a country. So I've been in countries where they haven't recognized the data that I've got from that country relating to primary education because our definition of what is a primary school is different from their education of what is a primary school. So we've had to adjust the data. And that's a huge problem, a very big tension for international agencies about how you get ownership but also encourage comparability. Um, the high profile has already been mentioned, so I won't go into that more. Um, too little analysis that's properly contextualized. Too much just reporting of the indicators, not enough actually interpretation of those indicators. Last couple of slides. There are ad real advantages of the model of, of comparability. Methodologies are shared and that can lower costs. We learn from one another. We can build communities of data collectors and analysts. We can ask uncomfortable questions in countries that otherwise wouldn't get asked because the country doesn't prioritize that as seen. Um, and I think we'll certainly see that happening in the SDGs. 
we are learning better how to use this to develop national capacity for data collection. And it does raise the political profile of data. But I come back to this challenge about local national specificity versus cross-national comparability and how we achieve both, how we get that balance right. Um, I'm very excited about the SDGs. Um, I think that they are correcting a lot of the problems of the MDGs around the fact that we measured too many things in terms of quantity, how many kids were in school, not whether they were receiving quality education. The inequalities I've mentioned, the variation within country, sustainability that goes right throughout this. It's, uh, economic growth is important, but it's not the only thing that's important within countries. The wide applicability and the inclusivity, which uh, Paul mentions in his paper. Um, I think this is my last slide. Um, composite indicators. Paul talks about adding together apples and pears. I think we have a number of problems with composite indicators. Is we do them as a communication tool, and the people who are using them often don't have great um, statistical skills. Um, in my new job at, at uh, Green Templeton College in Oxford, I've got the Reuters Centre for, for the Study of Journalism, which is fabulous. And so I go on a regular basis now to, to events that they organise. And I've been um, discussing with them the MDGs and the SDGs, and it's very interesting. We've got really top journalists from across the world, but they aren't very statistically aware, and they don't actually understand some of the problems relating to composite indicators. So they're taking this face value, and worryingly, they often are over-interpreting them. They assume that the weighting scheme to add together the apples and the pears has some scientific basis. And they don't realize the extent to which that's arbitrary, and you would get a totally different index and a totally different ranking if you had a different weighting scheme. And they don't pay enough attention to the issue, again, that Paul raises in his paper about how missing data are, are dealt with. And I have, just to end, I have an absolutely fantastic example of this. When I used to work at UNESCO, I had responsibility for delivering the data to UNDP for the Human Development Report. One of the indicators in the Human Development Report, uh, one of the um, pieces of statistics, is uh, literacy. And they need this literacy data every year. We don't have literacy data every year in the richest countries of the world. We certainly don't in the poorest. Lots and lots of problems, as you might imagine, about how you collect it, how you define it, how you collect it, particularly in countries like Papua New Guinea that might have over 400 languages. So, um, so lots of difficulties. So, and certainly you can't collect it every year. So what is done is the proxy is used, and the proxy that's used is five years of primary education. That then means that within the Human Development Index, there is almost perfect correlation between two different parts of the index, the, which is, as we all know, is one of the things you should be doing as a composite indicator. But some years later, um, after I thought this and not been successful because there was an issue, we can't change the index because we want to measure change over time, so we can't change it which is one of the problems. Um, uh, a paper came out showing that the criticisms of primary education were unjustified because, look, there was an almost perfect correlation between five years of primary education <laughs> and literacy. <laughs> I rest my head. <laughs> thank you very much indeed, Denise. And thank you to all our three um, respondents. Thank you. huge amount of um, food for thought in the three that responses that we've had so far and I'm sure um, a lot of questions in all our minds and, and, and points for discussion. We'll take a short um, tea break now
Um, if we can be back in our places, this is for the live, purposes of live screen. If we can be back in our places at um, 20 to 4, so 3.40, um, ready, to, um, ready to go with the discussion. So, um, fresh tea has just arrived, I think, fresh tea and coffee. So we'll be offline for about 15 minutes.
was routinely gender disaggregation when it can be done. But I mean, that there's that a lot of some of the, yeah. I mean, some, oh, of the goals, up, sorry. <laughs> some of the goals are specifically about gender, gender. so specifically have targets and indicators related to gender. So, well, it depends on, on what, the, what the measure is. So some of the measures, some of them are households, some of them are individuals, and it's different for different. There are 300 indicators, so some, yeah, some are. Elements of you know, not healthy, measuring air quality, water quality. Yeah, yeah. Underwater. Yeah. Deforestation. <laughs> so, uh, I mean, actually, I think gender is done pretty well. Yeah. Yeah. So, it's all a hashtag for each household member. If that's how you measure it, but you might be.